Hi everyone, so I'm doing my John Maxwell today. I didn't do it yesterday. I just had a lot of other things that I needed to do, including an HR refresher uh, webinar that I did on defined contribution pension plans and defined benefit plans. So here in Canada, we have uh, some companies, that big companies, that will give you a pension when you retire. And it was good to get that refresher for me and to focus on that. Sometimes the information is too much for me. So now they have a replay that they send us and I always look forward to getting that because I go back and I watch the replay and I try to absorb it. And I do take notes when I'm watching, but having the replay helps a lot because then I can focus on the key points and I can move on and do other things as well. And today I'm focusing on the next chapter of this book, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John C. Maxwell. He is a New York Times bestselling author and I am part of the licensed professionals that can use this material to speak, train and coach. So I'm trying to do this while looking for a job as well. And my focus is to help other migrants who come into the North American culture. So the point I'm focusing on today, I'm not going to do the whole chapter, but the point I'm focusing on is trust first, then support. And we have to look at our characters. So when we come here to Canada, nobody knows us. People might like us, but they are not likely to trust us. And we have to build that trust. We have to earn it. We have to prove it. So, for example, when I started working from home, I kept in close contact with my managers, with my supervisors, so that they knew where I was, they knew what was happening, including when we had a very dry spell. So what happens is, when it gets very dry here, the air in the condominium also gets dry. And when you come back inside, you can get heavy nosebleeds. So I, it was my first time experiencing this, and I could not believe it. For almost an hour, I had a nosebleed. And it's, I mean, if you're working from home, who's going to know that? Who's going to believe you? They might think that, oh, you're just having a jewel or you're just enjoying yourself. But I took some pictures and I took a video because I wanted them to know I was telling the truth. And I got a shock. So my doctor said to me, no, it's normal. You just make sure that you keep the air moist in your apartment. And if you have a humidifier, turn that on. If you don't have one, get one. So I have a little one here at home that I use. And I put my lavender essential oil in that as well, because that also helps me. So that those are some of the small things we can do if we are working at home. And just being honest with people about where we are, what we're doing. And not many companies are offering that work at home anymore. People want people back in the office because they want to see people. They have more control and... A lot of people like that. I also don't mind it because it gives me an opportunity to be with other people. I enjoyed working at home too, but it, there's extra costs for us when we work at home. We're using our electricity. We're using our internet. We're using our own uh, resources to get the job done. Whereas if you're in the office, the company covers all that and they get big tax breaks to do that. As individuals, we don't get that much. So you can claim for it at the end of the year when you do your taxes, but there's uh, only a certain amount that you can claim for. And I'm not incorporated, so I don't have that option of claiming everything. But it was good while it lasted. I did my duty as an essential worker. I worked from home. I got my vaccines. I wasn't comfortable with it because the vaccines were still being tested. They didn't know whether they were going to work or not. But I took the vaccine 
And when they said you have to get the booster, I took that too and I kept the proof of that. So the onus are, is always on us in this country. It's not a paternalistic country. It's not like Africa where it's uh, a top-down father knows best approach. Over here you have to learn how to ask questions. You have to learn how to make sure you keep your own records, make sure you keep your own documents, make sure you have things backed up. So for example, when I lived at Rosewell Gardens, I came home one day and I was talking um, to somebody on the phone. And as I was talking to them, I watched my, my computer getting wiped. And I was like, oh my God, what happened? So there was obviously a worm or a virus or something that got into my computer and I lost everything. So now I have a little um, hard drive that I got and I back up everything onto that periodically. That way I know I've got my photos, I've got my documents, whatever I need backed up and I'm not relying on the system or I'm not relying on other people. And that's what we have to do here. I think in Africa, we were spoiled because it was a very top-down approach. We expected companies to take care of us. We expected the governments to do the right thing. And even in the war, I mean, in as far as they could, they took care of us. I mean, we didn't have uh, in the war because they started shutting down um, our access to things in the Zimbabwe Rhodesia war. We did have rations and we had shortages and all that, but we didn't have uh, power cuts, electricity cuts the way they have now, rolling blackouts. Partly it's due to the lack of rain, but partly it was mismanagement. And even this weed, this Chinese weed that they introduced into the dams and all that, they said it was supposed to purify the waters. They've got the same problem here now in Canada because they work closely with the Chinese. So I was like, oh, why did you bother leaving Zimbabwe? You left one place for a better life and you came here and you landed up in the same situation, if not worse. You can't even earn a minimum wage to cover your rent, your food, your basic necessities. And it's not just me going through it. There's a lot of people going through it. But we have to focus on our lives and our character. And if you want to focus on a biblical principle, you can look at that uh, chapter or that uh, passage where Jesus says, tomorrow is not promised. You can build your barns and you can store grain in them. But if you die tonight, what's the point? Like what's going to happen? It's the, like the floods in Spain that we have now. We had earthquakes off the coast of BC. So I just take things one day at a time now because you don't know what's going to happen in the next moment. And when you look at these uh, Lord, laws of uh, leadership, they are important for our companies because Companies are losing good people because they're not focusing on character. They're not focusing on who are the leaders that are in their company that are making things better for others and for the company. They're only focusing on the profit, on the bottom line. So eventually that catches up and then the companies start to fail. And another difference is that like here, when you listen to John Maxwell speak, John Maxwell says, I'm John Maxwell and I'm your friend. We are not friends when we work in Zimbabwe and South Africa and all these places. But you have to always remember that that's their way of trying to make you feel comfortable, trying to build a relationship with you. It doesn't take away the power differentials. It doesn't take away the fact that they have more years of experience than you and they can they can slaughter you basically because they've got the networks, they've got the contacts, they've got people that they can just pick up the phone and call somebody in the Air Force or in the military or the police force because they've been here a lot longer than us and we are our contacts. Our contacts are spread all over the world. 
our friends, our families, they're not all in one place. So we don't have that strength that we used to have maybe growing up in Zimbabwe, where we could coordinate things, where we could work together to help each other get into jobs and things like that. It's not to say that we still can't help each other. We do still, I have friends in the Netherlands, in Holland, who are trying to put my name forward to positions. So we can still try, but it's not the same as when we are all together and we have strength in numbers. And for me, when I first heard that, I was like, what are these people talking about? We are friends, we are friends, we are like a family. You're like, I, I was very, very offended. I'm like, this is not my family. I have my own family. I come to work to do a job and I go home. You are not my family. And they're like, no, we are family. I was like, oh, really? You're a family. You're not my family. So it's a cultural difference that we have to adapt to, that we have to get used to, because we don't use terminology like that in Zimbabwe. We have that family feel, we have that strong bond, we have that trust, but we don't go around telling people, oh, this is my family. It's very abrasive when you come here from Zimbabwe or England or places like that, because people focus on saying this is my work this is what i come to do to earn a living so that i can achieve the goals that i want to in life and help the company achieve its goals but we are not friends so don't come and tell me that i'm your friend or i want to be your friend whereas here in north america it's quite common and even if you watch um, documentaries on bbc we are very careful about it when we come from Africa or places like that because it can be used to take women into prostitution. Now it's happening with the men too. There's these big companies, Abercrombie and Finch, where the men go out and they're being enticed for modeling roles and then they drug them or they put them in positions where they're basically being trafficked. So when we come here from Africa, we have to remember that it's a terminology, it's a way of speaking, it's a way of trying to build trust. And they, for me, I found it very offensive because I've watched those BBC documentaries where these Nigerian girls, the professors were abusing them. And they, they were using the relationships to say, come on, let's be friends and you'll get a good grade, you don't even need to study. So, you know, those types of things put us off because I never grew up that way. I never had that at Wits University. If I had even tried <laughs> that kind of a thing, I would have been let go from the university right away. They would have just basically expelled me as a student and the professors as well. There's no nonsense like that. So we have to get used to their ways of talking, their ways of speaking, their ways of what it means when they say, I'm your friend. They're just trying to put you at ease. But for us, it's very upsetting because we don't come from this culture here. So that's what we focus on. And it also depends on the company. Like when I worked at Ivanhoe Cambridge, they also didn't like it. When people were calling and saying, oh, this one wanted to be her friend, they're like, what? You're spoiling her reputation. Leave her alone. So it really depends on the company and it depends on the environment. It depends on what they're trying to do. Now with John Maxwell, he is accomplished. He's somebody that's proven himself. He's a best-selling author in New York. So it's different with him. But it doesn't really matter who it is. We always have to remember that they are trying to build a relationship. They are trying to accomplish something. And if we are coming here from England or Zimbabwe or Nigeria, we're very aware of how women get trafficked, of how they get taken into Boko Haram, of how they get fed these. Uh, it's just like a drip of vitamins. It's just water with vitamins, and now they keep women in harems. 
So we don't really, we're not really comfortable with that. But as I learn and as I get used to seeing how the Americans are, how they do things, I also learn from them. So as migrants, we can learn. We can watch on the news. We can watch and see how things are changing. Even now there's cannabis. They sell cannabis sweets and cannabis cakes and all that. Uh, there was a big thing on the news here the other day because Halloween is coming about the ones that are being sold illegally. People are making them at home. They're making them look like the real thing and then they're selling them. So there's more things here that we have to worry about that we didn't worry about when we were growing up because those things were basically just not accepted in our societies, even in the war. You do drugs, they'll just kick you out of the school. You want to smoke marijuana and that take that cough syrup and use it to get high. You won't have an education. So it's very different to how we grew up. And it might sound harsh to people here, but that's how they trained us. That's how they were with us. And that's how things were. And I don't know now how the system is because I have not been back. Um, into the schools and all that in Zimbabwe, but they're still strict. And if I get an opportunity to do my John Maxwell and to go out with the team, they do go, they go to South Africa, they go to Zimbabwe. I will use that opportunity. Right now, my focus is on getting a good paid job and building this business as well. So that's what I'm concentrating on. And that's what I'm doing and making progress. And I'm very thankful to the people that are subscribing and that are liking my posts on YouTube, on Twitter, not only for this, but also for the volunteering I'm doing. It helps. It helps me to get my name out and it helps to build my credibility. And also the posts that I'm doing, it's important to me because I don't just represent myself. I represent uh, people that have gone before me and we stand on shoulders of giants and uh, you know people like Steve Biko the musicians that were given honorary degrees from Wits University um, Huma Sekela Huma Sekela came to Zimbabwe we were the first country they came all of them came Paul Simon Huma Sekela they all came to Zimbabwe and then from there, they pushed for South Africa to get the independence. So it's a long journey and it's a long struggle, especially when you're trying to do it on your own and you're trying to network and go out. Every day when I go out, I try to talk to at least one person and make a contact, make a connection, tell them I'm looking for work in administration or HR. And I've got the Canadian experience now, so people are paying attention and people are trying to pass my name on, which also helps. So that's what I wanted to focus on today and just about keeping that balance. Like when they tell us, oh, I'm your friend. Yes, you have to remember that. OK, but also they have to remember what background we are coming from, because they do have trafficking here even in the church, even in the banks, everywhere. And the police are starting to catch them, which is good. But we definitely don't want to put ourselves into situations where we will be unsafe or we could land up being trafficked or people are creating the wrong impression of us. We definitely don't want that. We also have to look after ourselves and protect ourselves and keep the documents protect ourselves in that way too. Because the, that culture that we grew up with where the government was going to take care of us and people were going to be in companies for 10 years, 20 years, that's not how the world is anymore. So everybody's trying to hustle. Everybody that I know anyway has a job, but they're also trying to build a business on the side and create something for themselves. And that's what I'm also trying to do. I cut my hair. You can see I styled it and cut it. If I had gone to the hairdresser to do this, it would have been $95 for a junior stylist plus taxes. So 
I tried to save a bit of money. It's not as good as a hairdresser, but it's okay. <laughs> For me, it's okay. So I hope that helps you. If you're a migrant to Canada, that's something you can focus on. And if people are looking for speakers to help migrants to integrate, to look at cultural differences, and to help people, I'm willing to do that. And don't let them tell you their culture is more sophisticated than ours, because it isn't. There are some places in Canada and America that are very, very rural. They don't even have electricity there. So we are just as good as them. And we are just as educated and we are just as competent and we deserve to have good paid jobs as well. Especially those of us that have come here and have been forced to retrain, go to their universities, get their credentials. I've spoken to a lot of um, seasoned people from the African diaspora, doctors, lawyers, and they're telling me, <laughs> you guys have it so tough, man. They're like, we feel sorry for you because when we came, people were more welcoming. They helped us. We didn't have to do as much to get our credentials to practice in the medical field or in other fields. They're like, no, when we talk to you, when we talk especially to you young girls and to you women that are here, they're like, we can't believe what's happening. Because I talk to them, I tell them I've been here since 2002, and they're like, it's, it's tough. And many of them refuse to go back after Zimbabwe got independence. They're like, what? You want to come back and give us a piece of land and dictate to us how to live? All those demonstrations and all that that people had, like they're doing it now for Palestine. What are they doing now for Zimbabwe? Me, out of love for Canada and for Zimbabwe, I'm trying to do what I can. But where are all those people that were there on the streets in London saying, Smith must go, power to the blacks, majority rule. What are they doing? Where are they? Because it really gets my goat. None of them came back. They all stayed in their lives in America, in England, in Switzerland. They all stayed, and the people that were here were like, huh, we're not coming back. There was a process in place, and you guys broke the contract. We're not coming back. And they tell me, don't go back. Stay here, Belinda. It's hard, but stay here. So that's what I'm doing, and I'm trying to build my relationships with the African diaspora. And when I say African, I don't just mean black people. There's Indians here. There's whites here. There's coloreds. I'm trying to build those relationships. And some of them are very, very senior. They're VIPs. Yeah, I, I know my, I keep my decorum when I talk to them. You have to know your place in society. So I hope that helps you. And please pass my name on for speaking engagements and for any opportunities. My Elvis singing gets the most views, so... I want to go sing one day with Elvis in Graceland. <laughs>